what I loved is being able to create a fantasy world that there was no holds barred. Everything has to be designed, all the way down to the props, the bat suit, the Batmobile. Chance to build a Batmobile, you know, it's pretty rare to have an opportunity like that, so we uh, jumped in. In Batman, you want to take people to a world that they don't go to every day. The fun of any of these is that you're doing something that nobody has done before in the way that you're going to do it. Production design is crucial to every movie. It really is. Even the ones where it does, you don't think so. Because it's actually telling you the story. I mean, the place, the day, the weather, the storefront, the restaurant, the apartment is telling you so much information. Your eye gets so much information. It's as important as casting. It just should be invisible. In a movie like Batman, it shouldn't be invisible. I thought Barbara Ling would be brilliant for Batman. She's an extraordinary talent, and she has great imagination and great style, and she's just a force. And I, I thought Gotham City would be designed by a force. My job is really to bring the visual elements to create an overall world so that by the time costume starts, and other departments, there is a look, there is a coloration to it, um, and there's research and imagery and drawings to be able to give to the other departments. It's funny, there, there's times when Barbara is so busy, you almost have to take a number to see her because she has her hands in every department and every facet of the film, which is where she should be with it, uh, bringing her creativity to it. From the very beginning, when uh, he first asked me to do this with him, he said, let's make this completely our own thing. This was really Joel's Batman, and it was, you know, his vision of what it should be. And it's, you know, he, he was just said, there's nothing that we need to borrow from. The studio said, absolutely, it's Joel's. And uh, it gave us a clean slate to be able to uh, invent, from the Batmobile up, you know, everything we wanted to. My only suggestion to her was that we do faces and figures in the city so that the city had a personality. I didn't want it to be just monolithic or gothic structures. I wanted it to have some life to it. I feel we became very organic in the nature of, of the human anatomy. <laughs> you know, bringing that to the table, like a lot of the buildings you'll see in Gotham City, reflect large statures of men and women. I think, in, in a way, when you ever think really of Gotham, obviously, when it was, the comics were first being written was for New York. And, you know, um, because New York in the 30s was giant and grand. So all this, the sense of scale of the sets, the proportions of the buildings, statues are all um, heightened to be bigger than man. The idea was to keep it um, very much a sense, you don't know where you are, you don't know, it could be any time period, it could be. I mean, that's, um, that's very much what Gotham to me is about, is that you can never really pinpoint it. The idea too is that you're staying within mainly night, so neon becomes a very important element, and creating, um, many influences of neon. The beautiful neon signs of the 20s and 30s that would have really taken, you know, the look that you see kind of of 42nd Street in old black and white photographs to what Tokyo has now, which is wild graphics on giant proportions. <laughs> The Batcave was uh, was very modernized. You know, it had the hydraulics so the car could come up. It, it was still a cave with bats in it, but it was much larger. I think we took the hangar where the spruce goose is, and that's where we built the interior of the Batcave. And 
there, there's so many elements that are going on within that one set. Not only do you just have the look of it, you know, the underground cave look, you have the the positioning of the Batmobile, you have the turntable that it sits on, you have the moat that's around it. We just took things that you've seen before, which was there's always been a screen in the Batcave for Batman to sort of monitor what's going on. We just made it larger. Also, technology was changing so dramatically. You know, this was 1994, so we took advantage of that. The Batcave uh, evolved on the same level of the first time. We, first of all, we wanted to really see a full Batcave because they'd played it smaller um, or, or we just more down, you know, very few scenes in the Batcave in the original two. And we wanted to do big scenes, so we went, you know, much larger. The Riddler is Edward Nigma is this little um, nerd who starts out in a very narrow apartment, even with Clapper and his bicycle, and then he ultimately wants to run the world. So his lair at the end is, has all been created very recently, so it's very high tech, lots of, you know, neon and steel and glass, and it's very um, from the mind of an insane genius. The Riddler also is a jokester, and because he's always worn that really screaming green with the question marks on it, that's sort of, you start from there. You start from the green and sort of, you know, move out from there. He's an incredible challenge, the Riddler, because, you know, what do we, we knew what we were starting him in, but then, you know, what is his world? And it evolved from, like, a little power plant, but then he needed, but then you had to have a core, and then the, this kind of globe, and then, you know, it just, it, it evolved and evolved to, to become this kind of mad world of, um, of his. And of course, you know, I can't tell you how many question marks were, were made to, uh, before the ultimate question mark. I literally every day would walk on the set and, and just my jaw would drop to the ground. It was just amazing. You know, and that, that's the exciting thing about Batman, about this, this, this movie, you know, genre or whatever. It, it's, it's big. I mean, it's like the best of every department coming together. I simply love what you've done with this place. Heavy metal meets house and garden. <laughs> Beautiful. The fun of Harvey Two-Face is that he's a schizophrenic person, so, you know, we designed an environment that was half and half. And he even had two girlfriends. That became, you know, it, it, quite a challenge to figure out how to kind of cut the room or cut everything in half so that you have the bit of his world on either side of it. And, uh, you know, we, we went through a lot of progressions of like, you know, how, you know, how strange and gnarly this side of a couch could be to the normal side of the couch. He had such a definitive, I mean, in a way, when you're looking at somebody and they say, good, half is good and half is bad, you know, you have a, a much more definitive line to kind of go after. great thing about Joel is he just he gave us a vision you know in, in terms of, as, as the team you know and the team was was Barbara Lang, Tim Flattery and Charlie and I and a couple of our guys who were really ingenious designers as far as the vehicles went the kind of process that we brought to it to the the project uh, was based on you know what you would do in a, in a design studio so we had access to technology that that at that time was pretty cutting edge to General Motors. We worked with Barbara directly for about a, probably a six week period developing five different concepts. There wasn't a lot of excitement with those, those five models and Joel just wasn't feeling good about it so he sent us back to start over again. I don't think he, he felt like- Something there was spectacularly a, different. There was which something was interesting different. for me because I had worked on the original five models. The Batmobile in Batman Forever was the inspiration of, his, of that was really Giger. You know, Joel was very, uh, uh, loved the idea of it being something more organic. He was inspired by a leather fetish magazine, <laughs> of all places. That's probably going to get cut, but <laughs> it was a, a really organic, really animal uh, driven. It wasn't automotive. 
Yeah. He wanted it to feel like it was a, a living, breathing entity, not necessarily a car. We showed it to him and he loved it. It was a multi-layered vehicle. It's three principal layers of vehicle, one on top of the other. And uh, what we did is a clay model, full-size clay model, and modeled each level, did a, made a mold, and then modeled on top of that the next level, made molds of that, and worked to the third level, and then finally had the sets of, of tooling. So we, we actually, uh, in volume, did three cars to make one. We actually did two. There was a stunt car and a, yeah. and a hero car. <laughs> It has to be fast, uh, you know, it's, it's a Batmobile and, and we used a, a high performance V8 engine that's a racing motor, so it had plenty of horsepower. Steering wasn't always a big issue, although there are times when it has to do stunts. And that's why we built two cars, one that's designed specifically, it doesn't have an interior, it has a different roll cage, you know, to, to be used in the stunt. Ours, uh, I believe that car the two of them completed probably had about 8,000 man hours on it. And it represented about 30 different guys of different trades, different skills um, to, to, get it, to get it done. It was such a fast schedule and the car was so complex, we no one knew what it looked like until we, the day we put it together, which was a couple days before filming. So I started out, you know, brown hair, now it's more gray. And that happened pretty much in about six months. Whoa! It was very much what Joel wanted to make, was, you know, a film that just kept moving, had a, an exciting energy of its own that just kept, you know, and it did. Everything good is hard. You know, and, and I think you have to enjoy what you do, and, and I do, and I did. It's everything, they're just choices to hopefully entertain you. There's no, you know, deep, dark, intention except to entertain. It's to make as interesting and entertaining a Batman movie as you can. Now that's impressive!